I'm Jay Fidel, and I love being here, here on History Lens <laughs> with John Davidson. Maybe we need to do a show on the history of dogs, Jay. <laughs> history of dogs, you too. Have a little dog jumping. Yeah. By, by the way. Uh, <laughs> but two, please John, give generously, Jay. I keep interrupting you, Jay. It's Go okay. Ahead. You okay. finish your statement. Yeah. I want to hear more about yes, that Yes, give generously to the dogs. <laughs> no, to Think Tech Hawaii. Yeah. Yes. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. And John Davidson is a history professor at HBU. Some people feel he, was, he is the most distinguished ah, yes, history well, professor. Yes, don't ever call me that again, Jay. <laughs> <laughs> so okay. talk this is what happens when you get to be of a certain age. People stop saying, gee, he's handsome. No, they say he's, he's distinguished, which means you're really old. <laughs> don't call me that. <laughs> yeah, Jay, you look so distinguished. So, John, we can talk about populism in American <laughs> right, history right, today. That's right. And we, we, we have a bit of that going, going on right now. We do, indeed. That's and we true. have to study this, uh, you know, uh, and how it evolved and right. um, where, where we've seen it before. Right. In history. But right. what, what is populism? Yeah, so populism is basically, you know, a, a power of the people. It's a, uh, these, when we refer to populist movements, these are movements where the common man, the common woman, common humans, the working classes, farmers, lower class people. I mean, there are a lot of different ways to carve it out. But uh, when these folks stand up and vote and start protesting and, and uh, maybe, you know, have more of a say in politics. So what we find is a lot of these folks over the course of history, not just American history, but really world history, have not been very engaged over the long haul. But there have been these moments moments where, uh, you know, where the lower classes have emerged and uh, voted uh, what we would call, you know, a populist ticket or have voted for a populist movement. And in those moments, then, uh, there have been, there's been the possibility of dramatic change. And oh. that's one of the things we're going to look at today yeah, is the question I'm, of change and transformation. I'm, I'm interested, politics. though, in the notion that these, these are, you know, the lower classes. This country was not founded on a populist notion, was No, it? it was not. In fact, it, well, there are some, uh, mostly not, his, well, there's some historians too, conservative historians would argue, but yeah, it was, the, it was uh, founded by the American, it was founded by the colonists who served in the army, you know, and, and uh, you know, uh, did the boycotts and, the, you know, these kind of lower class people. Who, but honestly, the, 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 the colonies broke away because they had a very important uh, aristocratic leadership that decided that it was no longer in their interest to be a part of the empire. Right. Yeah, and they, so they didn't have enough power in they the didn't empire. Trust, they didn't trust the disenfranchised, yeah. disadvantaged lower classes to, to make the, well, the yeah. decision. It, yeah, right? it wasn't, it wasn't you in the revolution. couldn't vote, for example. Yeah, right. It, unless yes, you, exactly. you owned no, property, that's true. Right? That's true. After the revolution, then the establishment of the country was on an elitist basis. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. It was not a democracy at that point. Uh, very few people voted, uh, could vote, had voting rights. And uh, so, yeah, so it was, that was definitely not populist. Although there are some aspects of the revolution that are populist, the truth is that the founding fathers were mostly aristocratic, a few merchants in there, uh, and, and they were not at all interested in populism. They saw populism as quite dangerous, actually, ruled by the mob. Okay, ruled by the mob is, yes. is a problem because ah, you can yes. have the post-French Revolution kind of mob chopping everybody's heads off. Right. And that, that isn't necessarily we constructive. We don't want that. Nobody, nobody I want should to keep want my that. head. Yeah, right. right. Well, yeah, I, I, I know that my you, distinguished you, head. you would keep your head in any <laughs> such circumstance. But, you know, what, what troubles me is that when yeah. you have populism, people coming up, you know, from the bottom of the social yeah. and economic right. ladder. Right, right. Um, somebody has got to get them to come up. Yes. Somebody has got yeah, to be the true. leader of that's this true. deal. That's true. And, and whenever you have populism, you know, bubbling up to the surface like that, you have to, am I right? You have to look at who the leaders are, yeah, whether absolutely. the leaders are themselves yeah. from you the do. bottom, or you maybe do. the leaders are the aristocrats from well, the top, yeah, it can be. trying well, to make it is, look okay. like it's okay. from the bottom. Yeah, this you know? is... Okay, so when you talk about uh, this kind of populism from the top, shall we? Uh, this is what, uh, what happened in the 2016 election. Of course, Donald Trump was elected and he ran on this platform which was isolationist, it was anti-immigrant, it was uh, 
uh, the, the people in small towns and rural areas are not getting a, a good deal anymore, and Trump promised to give them a better deal. So in a way, he ran on a populist ticket, although when you begin to look at his policies, even his, uh, you know, the, the things that he ran on, his policies were definitely not populist overall. I mean, the tax cut, that's not populism. That gave most of the tax cut. 85% of the tax, the money from the tax cut goes to the ultra-rich. So we know that's not popular. You mean the tax reform bill of 2017 was a scam on the public? I, I didn't call it a scam. Oh, a deception but, then. <laughs> yes, yeah, it was, yeah, I mean, the thing is, uh, uh, yeah. So you have a, a president, a, a guy who ran as a kind of a, let's call him a pseudo-populist, or maybe a, this is a little cruder, a, a fake populist. Um, unfortunately, I think there's a lot of things that are fake about this president. But, so he, he runs as a kind of pseudo-populist, and then his policies, I mean, the most prominent is the tax cut, really, have been have really uh, not benefited uh, the common man much at all. Uh, so this is not really populism. So, Trump, and I, Trump's idea of happen. populism is Trump. That must happen. Right? I mean, I'm thinking of Huey Long in Louisiana, where you know he makes people feel like you know he's working for them, and and That's they're an they're bubbling up from the yeah. lower classes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But in fact, he's manipulating them. Well, yeah. So so Trump, I think, is in his own category as a fake populist. Yeah. Okay. I don't yeah. think we've ever seen uh, a populist who was so wealthy, so embedded in the ruling classes, uh, the you know the the wealth of the country. Uh, a, a product of the of the ruling classes who who claim to be a populist, okay? And I think that's quite frankly why uh, he he hasn't his popularity hasn't turned into a ma majority at any point because because he wasn't it, it's not authentic populism. But if you want to go back in time, okay, let's let's go back in time. Let's talk about Huey Long. Now we'll we'll go back further in a minute and talk about populists from the. 1870s to about 1900, but Huey Long is very interesting. Louisiana politician, uh, became governor of Louisiana, essentially ruled the entire state from the governor's office, uh, was actually, now this is interesting about Long, Long was, uh, Long got to power by fighting the entrenched oil interest in Louisiana, because at that time, uh, there were oil companies in Louisiana who were drilling in the bayous and controlled a lot of the politics of Louisiana, and Long said, those guys are bad, they're not serving the common man. And so, and Long did in fact uh, extend the social safety net in Louisiana when he became governor. Now, uh, so Long is actually a populist. He's, he's a guy who cares about the common man. The problem is he was a demagogue lying to the well, common man. He, he, remember, remember the line, you can <laughs> fool some of the people yeah. some of the time, you can fool all the people some yes. of the time, but you can't fool all the people all the time, which yeah. is, that was his demise. No, that's, that's right. So, so he's not, oh, this is a tricky one, Jay. I don't think he, again, once again, I don't think he's in the same category as Donald Trump in terms of demagoguery. Okay, okay. although Hugh, Hugh, <laughs> We won't ask one, which is the, the bigger demagogue. Which is the bigger demagogue? Well, Donald Trump oh, is, thank of course. You. Okay, Donald, we've, never had a, we've never had a politician in this country who lied so systematically okay, as Donald Trump. got it. According to one study that was done of the 2016 election, Hillary Clinton lied about 25% of the time, and Donald Trump lied about 75% wow. of the time. So, big difference there. Uh, but... But Huey Long is a fascinating guy. Yes, he does say things that are not true. That's absolutely true. And, and he attacks the great powers, right? And Long has a very interesting plan. It's called the Share the Wealth Plan, in which anybody who makes over a million dollars would be taxed at 100% for that time. Okay, the wealthy that's people. That's a lot of tax. That's yeah. a lot of tax. But a but million dollars, you know. Uh, the with, first million, what? No tax. The, the first million, no tax, and then after that, 100% tax. But then the proceeds from that would be used to make a payment to each family of, I think it was $2,000 a year. Guaranteed annual income. A guaranteed oh, annual right, income, okay. which has actually reemerged among the real populists, <laughs> yeah, really. the leftists in the Democratic Party. Those are the real populists right now, yes. by the way. Yes. Uh, they they want to fight income inequality. They want to uh, put forward health care. I mean, and they want to uh, attack uh, climate change because they know it's affecting uh, 
you know, middle income and poor people. So, so there are so so there are some ideas actually that come through from Huey Long's time into the present time. But uh, but so Long is a very interesting guy. He he actually runs for president. Uh, he's pardon me. He's going to run for president. He creates a national organization in 1934. Abandons Roosevelt, uh, and uh, and people look up to him. And you know he gets letters from constituents say, "Oh, you are you are right next to Jesus Christ as my hero." It was astonishing. Yeah, I mean he really developed a following. But then uh, he also had a lot of enemies. He went back to he was senator from Louisiana by this time running Louisiana from his Senate office, by the way. That's how much power he had. He was a populist, but he didn't really care that much about uh, democracy and doing things in a fair way. He liked power. Uh, he goes back to Louisiana, and, a, and an angry constituent shoots him, uh, although he would have survived except the doctor botched the operation, oh. and he died from this. So uh -huh. the Long's an interesting, uh, you know, short-lived, and could have he challenged Roosevelt in the 1936 election. Oh, I think if he had lived, he would have challenged Roosevelt. I don't think he would have won because what Roosevelt did was begin to move more leftward in response to people like Huey Long and Father Coughlin because they were pushing Roosevelt. They were saying, hey, uh, the poor people are suffering. Everyone's doing worse now. The economy's terrible. Look at all the rich people. So, so, so that's the kind of the main kind of outline of populism. W and Trump question. has a big problem with that because he is one of those rich people. Yes. Right? Attacking right. the rich is, it just doesn't work it very well. It sounds like populism him. is often confused with demagoguery. Well, there's a, there, <laughs> no, no, Jay, now you're, you're exposing the dark side, the, the dark underbelly of what populism. What about nationalism? Is populism related in some it way? It can that, be, yes, of course. Yeah, I mean, many populists have used very kind of uh, nationalist slogans. Unfortunately, how about race, populism, how about yeah, populism is, is associated with, can be associated with right-wing nationalism, associated with racism, associated with anti-Semitism, and associated with anti-immigrant. What uh, a great uh, yeah. package, John. <laughs> well, look, there are good populists, too. There are good and bad populists. There are fake and real populists. So um, Huey Long is a mixture, okay? He's definitely anti-Semitic. Um, he doesn't like immigration. He doesn't like immigrants. So he would fit in with the America Firsters. Um, he's uh, he's a racist, definitely. So, so oh well, what a guy. he favored the common man as just so long as the common man was an African American. <laughs> so the, I guess the populists make us laugh. I don't know. Uh, so one thing, I mean, going in, it sounds like a good idea. Oh, yeah. When you start examining what yeah. happened, and I, yes. I'd like to cover that with you in this yeah. country, over populism, it, it, it isn't necessarily a good idea well, at it's, all. Well, so, so, yeah, I mean, there's this open question, right? This is a question that's debated between John Dewey and Walter Lippmann in the late 1920s. Uh, Dewey's a famous philosopher, of course, philosopher, edu philosopher of education. Mm -hmm. And Walter Lippmann is actually, uh, he, he becomes the, the most famous journalist of the first half of the 20th century, and, and he majors in philosophy, so he understands Dewey. And the two of them publish books arguing back and forth about democracy. Dewey says that we don't have enough democracy in the United States. Lippmann says we have way too much democracy, that things like populism, rule by the people, are quite dangerous, and we should accept the fact that that there are elites, that there are, that people in the middle class, that educated people should be in charge of government. Therefore, we won't have problems with, uh, with people who don't know how to govern, who don't know much of, of anything yeah. uh, governing. And, and uh, quite frankly, I mean, you, you know, a, a guy like Donald Trump who, who has a college education, but never, clearly never studied the Constitution, is... Uh, he's he's out. You've said this before. He's outside of the political norms, uh, and now he's doing things that are way outside of the political norms and are really unconstitutional. Unconstitutional, and I think will be ruled as unconstitutional in the courts. Knock wood. You know, this is the 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 wall, the national emergency for the wall, and and the stuff about free speech and and universities and the rest of it. The 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 the, the the statements or the the declarations themselves are so poorly constructed that they're not going to they're not going to have constitutional muster. 
but they do provide him a platform for attacking others and for trying to re-energize his populist base. Yeah. You know, he, yeah, go ahead. I, I just like to say that um, I, I don't know if his grades in college were very good. <laughs> there, was, there was some revelation of that. Uh, he tried to stop the... Uh, he, he tried to stop the uh, disclosure of his grades. Oh, is that right? Oh. Although there was somebody who had part of it, and his grades were really poor. Yeah, I mean, you so, know, the, I, the thing is... During so, this break, John, the yeah. break that's just coming okay. up, I, why don't I make a call and see if he'll <laughs> no, don't. Ag agree Jay, to we're reveal keep his you, grades. Where's Jay's phone? We're going to keep the phone away from Jay. <laughs> we'll be right back. Aloha. I'm Lauren Pear, a host here at Think Tech Hawaii, a digital media company serving the people of Hawaii. We provide a video platform for citizen journalists to raise public awareness in Hawaii. We are a Hawaii nonprofit that depends on the generosity of its supporters to keep on going. We'd be grateful if you'd go to thinktechhawaii.com and make a donation to support us now. Thanks so much. Aloha. This is Winston Welch. I am your host of Out and About, where every other week, Mondays at 3, we explore a variety of topics in our city, state, nation, and world, and uh, events, organizations, the people that fuel them. It's a really interesting show. We welcome you to tune in, and we welcome your suggestions for shows. Um, you got a lot of them out there, and we have an awesome uh, studio here where we can get your ideas out as well. So I look forward to you tuning in every other week where we've got some great guests and great topics. You're going to learn a lot. You're going to come away inspired like I do. So I'll see you every other week here at 3 o'clock on Monday afternoon. Aloha. Okay, we're back, and I want to tell you, John, that he said he would not reveal his grades in college. <laughs> Um, nor, nor would he voluntarily give up his tax returns yeah, yeah, yeah. for yes, then right. or any other right, period right, since then. Right. So anyways, but, yeah. so, so when we look 1890s, at, 1890s. We, right, when we look at populace, uh, populism historically, it's a very interesting species. Um, I wouldn't say it's a dominant pattern in, I would not say it's a dominant pattern in American uh, life, in American history, but when it crops up, it has some very interesting characters, uh, they're, you know, they're energized, they're, they want to speak to those who are, you know, disenfranchised, those who are down and out, who are struggling. So, so in the 1870s, this is when populism first crops up after the Civil War. Mm. In the 1870s, what you have is a new economic world in the United States, the, the rise of, of manufacturing at a very big scale, the rise of steel manufacturing. Uh, the price of a ton of steel drops from, from like $100 a ton to $12 a ton by the, by the oh. late 1870s because of new technology involved in Bessemer. In the, the Bessemer Still process. In that, Pennsylvania. That, that's right, you know, Henry Bessemer. So, so you have uh, the development of these large enterprises. Uh, you know, you have uh, uh, Carnegie Steel, you have Standard Oil of John D. Rockefeller, you have uh, all kinds of mining interests. I mean, these very big companies, uh, railroad interests, uh, all of it. So, so what it means is that they control a much larger share of the economy than they did before the war. The robber barons. That's right. That's correct. So, and on the other hand, farmers uh, are kind of suffering, uh, not just because of industrialism, but yeah, I mean, what's happening is the economy is rebouncing away from farming and in favor of industrialism. Uh, the, the number of farmers drops dramatically after the Civil War. Incomes of farmers drop. The price of corn drops from like 66 cents uh, a bushel to about uh, 35 cents a bushel by 1890. So, so it's, and it's, it's a lot of things. It's the new industrialism, it's uh, droughts, you know, crop failures and the rest of it. Uh, and so the farmers are really suffering actually in the 1870s. And farmers rely on two things in this time period for their, really for their livelihood. And that's local banks who provide them with funding because farmers always have to have access to credit, right? And then the other is local elevators. 
that they take their crop to, that which then, you know, the, they buy the crop and then the crop is shipped Somebody out. Somebody had to railroad. put the capital in to build the elevator. And the railroad operators and the bankers, uh, they are a part of these small towns and a part of farming communities. But the economic situation is that uh, interest rates are high, somewhere between 6 and 8% in this time period. And uh, the banks, therefore, can charge farmers, you know, up to 8% on their land and on their equipment and everything. And the elevator operators are dubious in some cases. So elevator operators, they grade the grain that farmers bring in. So, for instance, uh, farmers will bring in winter wheat in places like North Dakota. They bring it in, in the spring. And, and the elevator operator will grade this wheat, and they'll grade it on a scale, and they'll, they'll grade the wheat that, uh, that they buy from the farmer as a C, or a, a lower grade scale, and then they'll sell it as an A. Ooh, which that's is, yeah, tricky. It's, that's yeah, it's a very just... unsavory business. It's yeah. illegal today to do that. But, so, so you have these farmers who are suffering because of this, the twin evils of the banker and the elevator operator, and they begin to organize. Uh, and there's a, there's a woman, her name is Mary Lease, and if we, we've got a picture of yeah, we, we can a bring it up. Her, yeah. uh, there's Mary Lease right there. Mary uh, apparently said at one point, let's raise less corn and more hell. Ah, nice. <laughs> uh, yeah, she, so she was quite the populist. She became an organizer for uh, the, the, what was called the Farmers Alliance uh, back in that time period. Uh, and uh, uh, she was... So she traveled the country giving speeches and trying to bring farmers into the, into the Farmers Alliance. And so, so this becomes a very big organization. Now, there are actually two organizations. There's the Grange, which I'm, you might have heard of the Grange, maybe not. Sure. The Grange. And the agricultural that's organization. That's right. The, yeah. the Grange is the earliest populist movement mm -hmm. in the 1870s. Mm -hmm. And interestingly, the Grange still exists today. Mm -hmm. It's a very small organization today, but it's. There it is. It still exists today. In rural America. In, in rural America, that's right. And, and then after that, the Grange, uh, at, at their height in the mid-1870s, they have about 500,000 members. Wow. Yeah, it's, it's decent sized. And then, then after that, in the 1880s, then there's another organization that appears called the Farmers Alliance. This is the one that Mary Lease is, uh, works for. And this organization develops a membership of over a million people in the, in the 1880s and the early 1890s. So, so these are going organizations. They're successful organizations. And uh, they're successful because the farmers are really struggling. It's an economic um, effort by the farmers. And I, I guess what I'm hearing from you is that if, to the extent it was populist, the, the base, so to speak, was... There were farmers. It, that's that's and it correct. There wasn't bankers, and there wasn't correct. railroad that's guys, correct. and it wasn't eastern money. That's correct. It was farmers no, outside right. of the eastern money. So, so it's really a, a, an alliance of, of Midwestern farmers <clears throat> and then uh, Southern farmers. And the Southern farmers are, have a little different story than the Midwestern farmers with the elevator and the bankers. Southern farmers are primarily tenant farmers. They work on plantations, and they, they share their crop, their share crop. And that's how they pay for things. So southern farmers really don't have to worry about credit. Well, they should worry about credit because when they have to borrow money, they borrow it from the plantation you mean owner. liberated slaves? Yes. So that's what, okay, so this, this the, is sharecroppers the sharecroppers in the south that's correct. were the slaves uh, who, who had to do that the, to stay alive the, after the war. That's correct. It was yes, not so, a pretty picture. That's right. So they become a part of the underclass, the farming underclass, and it's not just Slave, former slaves. It's actually whites and former slaves and some Native Americans. They become tenant farmers and uh, they're they per they, perpetually they, in debt. Yeah. Uh, the plantation owner holds that debt yeah. and therefore they can never leave the plantation. Yeah. It's like a form of slavery. Yeah. Yeah. And, so, uh, and so the tenant farmers are arguing for, uh, for more freedom from this debt and for uh, a, you know, a, a, a fairer share that they would pay to the, to the, uh, to the plantation owner. So, so, so that's where populism emerges. It emerges quite powerfully in the South and then powerfully in the Midwest. Mary Lisa's is in the Midwest. Another famous populist, Tom Watson, becomes leader of populists in the South. We have, a, we have a picture of Tom, Tom Watson Tom here. Watson. There's Tom Watson. Yes, yeah. handsome young man. Tom's a very interesting guy. Uh, he's from Georgia, family of slaveholders. 
Um, still stayed on the farm and, you know, they still, they still owned the same land without the slaves after the Civil War. But Watson was a, from a family of duelers. So when, duelers. when he was growing up, if he was actually offended by a, a friend of his once. He challenged him to a duel and they went, because Georgia had a law against dueling, and they went to Alabama in order to do their duel. And I think Watson killed the man, actually. So uh, dueling was really dying out by the 1890s. But there no, is no, Tom pun, no pun intended. <laughs> yeah, yeah, sorry. <laughs> Oops. <laughs> yes, right. Uh, so the Watson's an interesting character. He writes poetry. Uh, he's a duelist. He's a very smart young man. And he becomes interested in the populist cause. But he's also an ambitious politician. And this is perhaps where the populists get into trouble or where they have to be more careful. I don't, I don't think it's trouble it necessarily. It sounds like the aristocrat becoming the leader of a populist movement, which is composed of underclass. Yeah, I mean, his, you know, the farm is he's, it's a going concern. He's certainly not a tenant farmer. You know, his, yeah. his, his family has money, has means. Uh, but he cares about the, the little guy. He suffers from some of the same problems as okay. the tenant farmers in that uh, the local politicians are always making laws that, that uh, are against the smaller farming interests and in favor of, of the, the plant plantation owners themselves. This was so, a, an agricultural rebellion of oh, sorts, it, it, all it of it. absolutely is, yeah. So yeah. How, what, what, at the height of it, how big was it and right. how much political power did it have either in the states or in federal government? Right, so Watson becomes the major force in the South, and by the early 1890s, then in the election of 1890, and then again in the election of 1892, the populace, in, especially in the South, do very well. Uh, in 1892, they take over eight legislatures. Uh, they elect their candidates to five governorships. Sounds like reconstruction of sorts. It's, but... Well, it's, it's, uh, it certainly is a going movement. The, thing, the difference between this and Reconstruction is Reconstruction supported rights for African Americans. Now, the early years of the populist movement in the South, there are uh, black and white tenant farmers who are working together uh, within the populist movement. Mm. Al although the populists never allow African Americans to join, the Farmers Alliance has a separate colored farmers alliance for African Americans. Interesting. It's well, the those only way the, those were the days yeah, when the, that sort of thing. Yeah, the, the, the only way they could make it work. But yeah. significantly, Tom Watson actually campaigned alongside African American organizers in the election of 1892. So Watson, it seemed as though was was not opposed to organizing African American tenant farms. The problem is this changes later on. So you have this success in 1892, in 1896. Uh, the movement, the populist movement tries to take another step, and they fuse with the Democratic Party. William Jennings Bryan runs for the presidency under the, Demo the fused populist and Democratic banner. Uh, we actually have a picture let's, let's of, of William me. Jennings Bryan as well. There's, there's the young William Jennings Bryan. One of the I greatest. looks like Ted Cruz. <laughs> no, I, one of the greatest orators of the, of the 19th oh, and early right, 20th century. Right, right, right. Could speak for hours without notes. Um, uh, so, so Was, wasn't he involved in the, uh, in the monkey trial? Yes, yeah, as a very old. 20, 20 he was, years later. He was quite old. And that's a different William Jennings Bryan. Bryan was also an evangelical Christian. Yeah. And in the Scopes trial, of course, he was arguing against evolution. Uh, and two weeks, the, the, it was a great embarrassment to him, the trial was. You know and two weeks later, he died. Oh. Maybe of embarrassment. Speaking of embarrassment. Yes. yes. We're out of time. Oh, my God. I'm sorry. But this okay. is so interesting. Okay. I mean, you this, know, is, this is you really sure you a great, stop? great, well, no, I don't. But it's a, it's a great okay. narrative, and we're right in the middle yeah, of it. Yeah, yeah, It's true. all about populism. Yeah. So uh, well, let's, well, let's schedule yeah, another show yeah. on populism. Just, just a, little, uh, you know, a little sneak peek at the next one. Watson is not quite the man we think he is. Tom oh. Watson. Yeah. My curiosity run yeah, us over. Yeah, uh, see? Yeah. Watson okay. is not the man we think he uh, is. Yeah. Thank you, John. Sure, John yeah. David and a distinguished <laughs> professor from HP. Yeah, there you go. We'll be back soon, you'll see. <laughs>